Okay, I, I think that uh, that we'll get started now. Um, so a uh, very warm welcome to everybody who's joined us today. Uh, my name is Sharon Peacock. I'm a director of COG UK and professor of uh, public health and microbiology at the University of Cambridge. So uh, we are, I'm very excited today that this is the very first event of uh, Women in COG. Uh, this is a, a very important topic for the entire consortium. And I'm really delighted uh, that Charlotte Summers has agreed to join us today. Now, uh, Charlotte uh, is somebody who I have huge respect and admiration for. Actually, she has been an incredible woman over the pandemic and, and perhaps we'll get some insights into that. Um, but she's been, uh, and you'll hear more about her, her bio in a moment, but certainly has been uh, on the front line in uh, Adam Brooks Hospital uh, in intensive care units. Uh, running uh, clinical trials uh, and so that we can actually pair, care better for people with, with COVID-19 and has also been out at front of camera uh, to the media, which I think is quite a tough thing to do for any of us. So I'm really pleased uh, to welcome you here today, Charlotte. So what I'd like, I'm, I'm, I'm just the, the housekeeper today. And so I'm going to just make a few kind of announcements and then I'm going to hand over uh, to the chair of the meeting today, Catherine Ludden, um, who is uh, our incredible uh, director of uh, operations for COG UK, and she'll be uh, leading us through uh, the, the, the session. So just to let you know that this is recorded, uh, this event, uh, the recording will be retained and will be shown on the COG UK YouTube channel. Uh, so you can go back and listen to it there. Uh, if uh, please turn off your cameras uh, during uh, the meeting, unless you want to ask a question, just stay on mute if you would please. If you want to pose a, a question, uh, then please add that to the chat, or when we get to the Q&A session, uh, then simply raise your hands. I think that's all my announcements, and I'm gonna hand over now uh, to Catherine, who's going to take it from here. So thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you very much, Sharon. And sim similar to Sharon, I can just echo my excitement for having Charlotte as our very first guest on Women in COG today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your fascinating career so far. And I'm sure everybody on the call is very excited to hear more. Just as a brief bio um, for everyone who's not familiar with uh, Charlotte's fantastic career so far, and um, for all of us to inspire towards. Um, Charlotte is a Cambridge University Hospital physician who has spent the last year combining treatment of patients with COVID-19 in intensive care, combined with also doing laboratory research, and as Sharon mentioned, also setting up many clinical trials. Sharon had graduated in both biomedical sciences and medicine from the University of Southampton, and later undertook a PhD at the University of Cambridge, where she investigated the role of inflammation on the pulmonary transit kinetics of human neutrophils alongside specialist clinical training in respiratory and intensive care in medicine. She was subsequently appointed as the UK's first NIHR clinical lecturer in intensive care medicine and went on to be awarded a Fulbright All Discipline Scholar Award and a Wellcome Trust Fellowship for postdoctoral clinical scientists. Sharda joined the University of Cambridge School of Medicine in 2015 from the University of California, San Francisco. So that's just a brief bio, but today I hope we can get into more details of Charlotte, how you've progressed this career and, and just some insights that you can provide everyone on the call. So I'm going to start with um, just an informal conversation with Charlotte so we can get to know more about your background and how you've, how you've progressed and also challenges you've overcome. And as Sharon mentioned, we'll go to a Q&A then where people can ask additional questions. So Charlotte, just as an introductory, would you mind giving us just a, a brief overview of how when when you got interested in STEM and just a brief overview of your background, please. Sure. Um, I'd like to start in a slightly different place, which is to say thank you to all of the COG UK members who are on this call and the wider COG community. Your contribution during the pandemic has been phenomenal uh, and has been the bedrock on which so much else has been built. So thank you for all you do and continue to do because it really, really does impact at the bedside and we're incredibly grateful for the leadership you've shown in this space. Um, moving on to me, I guess, I was born in the southwest of the UK. Uh, I come from a family that was not a traditional academic background, neither of my parents went to university. 
Uh, and I went to the local state schools, um, including the local comprehensive school. And it's fair to say it was a fairly diverse comprehensive school, as comprehensive schools often are. There were people in my classes at 16 for whom reading was not a strong point, um, and all the way through to people like me who were a little bit more academically minded. So it was quite a challenging environment in some ways. Um, I had parents who very much valued education and thought it was important. Uh, and I think importantly also a dad who had two daughters and didn't really see that this was an issue that girls could do exactly the same thing as boys and that that really wasn't ever a topic that appeared in our house, that there were things that we couldn't do. Um, we were not limited and that was very much his ethos. I went to meet the school careers advisor when I was 16 um, and everybody had to go and you had your predicted A-level grades and the careers advisor said, so imagine you get two Ds and any at A-level. Nursing is a really great job for a woman. Um, and I said, I, I had thought maybe I would go and do medicine, um, having not really seriously thought about medicine before, but being a fairly contrary teenager. Um, and the response was, no, 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 girls and girls like you can't be doctors, you should be a nurse. Um, now there's nothing wrong at all with being a nurse. I value my nursing colleagues all the time, but I took exception of being told I couldn't do something because I was a girl. And more importantly, I was a girl from my socioeconomic background. Um, so I was a stubborn, horrible teenager. And so from that point onwards, I was only ever going to go to medical school, whatever they said. So I set about making sure that that's what happened. And I got into medical school in Southampton and loved it. I have to say, Shada, that I love the stubbornness. And I think uh, stubbornness and resilience may uh, be an important part of many scientists. And I think you've really highlighted some, some key areas there about you know, gender norms from, from growing up and the importance to say that everybody has the opportunity to do anything um, and there shouldn't be divided based on, on gender. So really thank you for kind of highlighting different things that were said to you growing up and, and how you basically powered against what you were told. And, and thank you for doing so, because now we have you as a great physician and, and a scientist. Um, just moving on to the, the undergraduate then, Charlotte, would you mind just saying what kind of subjects did you like studying? Was there any particular favorite subject? Um, and really kind of how did you then progress that into you know, your future career path to what you went on to study? So I guess medics can broadly be kind of split into those that love physiology and how things work, and those that love anatomy who are much more about kind of naming things and understanding structure. I was definitely a physiologist. I loved the working things outside of things. Um, and anatomy was not particularly a strong point because it was just learning large amounts of things uh, and that required a discipline I probably didn't have. And then in it would have been about part if you're in the third year of medical school in Southampton we got a lecture uh, and I've written about this before so this won't be news to anybody who might have seen my Twitter feed. Um, someone stood at the front of a lecture theatre and said that if any of us ever wanted to have teaching hospital careers or amount to anything, was the phrase that was used. Uh, we would need to do intercalated BSCs, but the problem was it was a really competitive programme. They only took 10 people a year and most of us wouldn't be good enough. Um, so cue my stubborn phrase and being told I can't do something. Uh, and so having shown no interest in doing much other than passing the exams and playing hockey, uh, I decided that I was absolutely going to be in that BSC programme. Uh, I was fortunate enough that I managed by the end of that year to get the grades to get a place, but also got a scholarship from the British Pharmacological Society, which meant that I had funding to cover my fees for an extra year at university um, and some living money, which made a tremendous difference. Um, I then arrived to do a year worth of lab research, which is what happened um, in Southampton for my particular integrated BSc, having never been in a lab before. Uh, and discovered that I absolutely loved it. I would never have imagined that I was a kind of lab-based scientist, but it was the best thing. Um, and I found something that has stayed with me as a love since then. I was fortunate enough to join the laboratory of someone called Professor Jane Warner, who was a non-clinical scientist who had returned from John Hopkins. So he had a really global perspective about science uh, and women in science. 
uh, and she was hugely supportive. And again, didn't really see that there were any limitations on what someone who was just a medical student could do. I was quite good in the lab. I worked really hard because I enjoyed it. Um, and so Jane provided opportunities. One of which was that I got to meet Professor David Lomas, uh, but he wasn't prof at that point, I guess. He's Professor David Lomas now, who's the um, Pro Vice Provost for Health at UCL, uh, but was a lecturer in Cambridge at that point. Um, he was the first real clinician scientist that I'd met. Uh, and the research I'd been doing was around protease, anti-protease balance in the asthmatic lung. Um, and the anti-protease I was interested in was his big research area, alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, and so I came and spent some time in David's lab up here in the CIMR, the Cambridge Institute for Medical Research, learned some new laboratory techniques. Uh, and he became a mentor and has stayed with me as a mentor since then, and it's been nearly 25 years. Uh, so I remain incredibly grateful for that. Um, but that's where my love of science came from, that first few months in the laboratory in Southampton. Thank you, Sharon. I think you touched on points which will come out through different stages of the questions here. One is, of course, is the love for being in the lab and how you're going to combine that with clinical medicine, but also the importance of a mentor. So I think if we touch on the first bit, which is at the science, and just to say, give us more about how you got into doing your PhD and then how you actually balanced that PhD with your clinical training. So I knew when I was an undergraduate that I absolutely wanted to do more research. Southampton didn't have an MB PhD programme, but I think if it had, I would have given it anything to do more research at that point uh, and then finish my medical training. So I was really sad to leave the lab and go back full time to the wards. Um, but it was some years before I could come back to research. So I did house jobs in Southampton and Bath uh, and then moved up to Cambridge to do the medical SHO rotation at senior house officer kind of junior doctor posts um, and knew all the time I really, really wanted to do research. Um, I then got appointed to a registrar post in, in respiratory medicine, uh, but also by this point had realised I quite loved intensive care medicine as a clinical specialty. Um, and so I wanted to spend some time doing that in London alongside my respiratory training in the east of England. Uh, the east of England in those days didn't think that they needed intensive care physicians that were from a non-anaesthetic background. So the only place that would train a non-anaesthetist was London. So I spent some time doing ICU at St Thomas's. Uh, and whilst I was at St Thomas's, Edwin Chilvers, who was the Professor of Respiratory Medicine at Cambridge at that point, who had sat on my registrar interview panel, phoned and said, uh, I think I might have a project you might be interested in, and I think that you would be a great fit for my lab, um, which was amazing, kind of stood in the middle of the intensive care unit in London to have the professor of respiratory medicine phone you and say, I think you might be suited to come and work with me. Um, it was an intervention that changed my career, no doubt. So I met with Edwin uh, and we wrote some fellowship applications, the first of which went to the MRC and I did not get, I didn't even get shortlisted. Uh, the second of which went to Welcome, uh, who were much more enlightened, clearly, than the MRC in those days because they funded me and I got to do my PhD with Edwin. So I returned to the East of England and to Cambridge uh, and spent three years in Edwin's lab doing my PhD before going back to London um, for a little bit to do some more clinical training. It was quite hard to factor everything in because I was already doing things that people who do intensive care medicine generally don't do. There's not many intensive care physicians with PhDs uh, and I'd already got to a situation where I was training in intensive care medicine as a physician and doing my physicianly clinical work in another region and now asking for a PhD. But people were remarkably indulgent um, and it wasn't really ever a significant problem. They went out of their way to be helpful. Did you find it difficult, Charlotte, writing your thesis and doing clinical work? Oh, it was time. awful. It was absolutely awful. So I finished my PhD in Cambridge uh, and went immediately back to full time clinical work uh, down in London. So I was away from the lab. I was working long hours in clinical work. Uh, and it's almost immediately, actually, as I went back to clinical work, we had a different pandemic to the one we're having now. I went back in the August. And then for those of you that are old enough to remember, winter 9, 10, 10, 11 was a swine flu pandemic. Uh, so if you were working in intensive care, you were pretty busy those winters when I was trying to write up my thesis. Um, and then in 2010, I actually became pregnant with uh, Henry, who is our son. Uh, and I wasn't 
terribly well when I was pregnant. Um, and so I was, I'd managed to write up the thesis and submit it. Uh, and I did my viva when I was 20 something weeks pregnant, managed to get the corrections done the following week. Uh, and was so unwell, I was admitted to hospital two hours after having submitted the corrections. Um, and then Henry arrived somewhat prematurely a few weeks later. So he actually is in all my PhD graduation photographs because he arrived unexpectedly early and I wasn't well enough to go and get my PhD until I actually had the baby. So there's a bit of delay between thesis submission and actually being awarded. That's indeed a lot of juggling, Charlotte, at one time. <laughs> and I'm in awe that you managed to keep sane through it all. You mentioned there about your son, Henry, and just wondering, there's, there's various people on this call, I'm sure th throughout COG and, and elsewhere, that you know, have children or doing research at the same time. But I'd be interested to hear if you experienced any judgment or obstacles from being a mother and also trying to do research. Oh, totally. Um, I think all women who have a family and many that don't experience judge judgment from external sources in that space, um, a whole range of things. So I think probably the starkest example I've got is after I came back from maternity leave and I chose to take five and a half months of maternity leave off. I, in retrospect, probably should have taken longer, but that's the decision I made because I had PhD students and people working in my lab at that time that I felt needed me. But on the first day I came back, I got probably 10 yards into the building in which I was working uh, where someone stopped me and a senior male stopped me and suggested that, of course, now I was a mother, I was going to be giving up my academic aspirations and wanting to work less than full time. Um, and when I said, uh, no, actually, I'm coming back full time and my husband has chosen to stay at home um, and look after our son whilst he's ill. The plan had originally been that Henry would go to nursery, but that wasn't feasible for one or two reasons. Uh, but Will had decided to stay at home. Uh, and the response was, but however will your poor husband cope? Um, and there's lots of things wrong with that sentence, isn't there? Firstly, that why shouldn't a dad cope? And why is it poor for a husband to stay at home uh, and not a woman? I shall grip my teeth and try to reserve some comments on that shout out. But I, I completely agree. I think everything you said there is a shocking. And I would hope that since then that it's got better in treatment of people with children. I, I, I don't think we're there yet that we have the gender equality that people can accept that, you know, men can also stay at home and look after children, but also the women, of course, can have the opportunity to be successful in their career and have children. So thank you for sharing that. And I'll be interested in the Q&A if people also want to voice any of their um, experiences they've had and to discuss it further. I think the other thing that I would just jump in here and say is that it's not just women with children who get judged. Um, women who choose not to have children also get judged uh, and there will be very many people who have had that oh well you're clearly um, focused on your career and don't care about having a family or a whole host of other inappropriate comments made. Uh, human beings judge other human beings and sometimes feel the need to share that um, so I think we're damned whether we do and damned whether we don't some days. Indeed and I think it's an issue that we need to keep raising and making sure that we try to reduce that judgment um, and just to get on with what's in front of us and that we that shouldn't be a factor. So thank you. I'm also aware, Charlotte, and, and again, and slightly in awe, I should say, is that you moved to San Francisco um, with Henry, who I don't think was, was very old at the time. So I'm, I'm interested in just hearing about how you found moving to San Francisco and the transition and the job and also how, you, uh, how that was with, with you and with your family with that move. So... Um, as I mentioned just now, my husband was at home full time and we had thought about moving abroad at some point before Henry had been born and we both said we'd like to spend time in the United States. Um, and then the opportunity to go to the US came up uh, and Henry was two and a bit when we relocated. Um, but I have to say, Will organised pretty much everything because I worked up until the two days before we flew uh, and went to work pretty much straight away when we got to San Francisco. So I most definitely cannot take all the credit for getting us there. Um, but children are remarkably movable. Um, and actually taking a two-year-old abroad was much easier than we thought it might be. 
Um, it has had some long-term consequences though, I should point out. I have a son who, because he was two when he moved, doesn't remember that he wasn't born in California uh, and therefore thinks that his terrible parents forced him when he was five to move to Cambridge. Um, and so for a long time, when asked where his home was, he would tell you it was San Francisco. Asked where he was, where he lived, he would tell you Cambridge in a kind of begrudging fashion. And I think I'm pretty convinced that when he gets the chance, he'll be off back to California because he considers himself a Californian and not British. Did you notice anything different, Charlotte, in, in work life balance in San Francisco and, and in the UK? And when you returned to the UK, did you to bring any of those perspectives back with you and into the workplace? The thing that I most noticed is that when I sat in the big academic meetings and the department meetings, there were a lot more people that looked like me in San Francisco than there were in Cambridge. And I probably hadn't noticed it so much in Cambridge, um, despite the fact I've always felt very strongly about equality for women. It was much starker when you suddenly find yourself sat in a room where at least half the people in the room looked like you, and they were senior academic women, um, which was not something that I'd count encountered so much in the UK setting. Um, it felt like it was more possible to rise as a woman in at the University of San Francisco or California, San Francisco, uh, than I'd realised. Um, and they were amazing and supported, and they, most of them had families and were making it work. Um, so it was a very different environment. All environments have their issues, um, but suddenly I'd realised that there were a lot more people who looked like me there. Uh, and when I came back, that impact was maintained because obviously when something is with you and it's taken away again, you notice it even more. So I imagine you voiced your opinion on and having, you know, having more people represented females wise and, and kind of seeing kind of telling people what you've seen in the US and, and kind of guiding on that in the UK. I have always struggled with keeping what I think um, not written all over my face, even if it doesn't come out of my mouth. So I suspect no one who knows me was under any illusions how I felt. I think, to be honest, though, it's important to be clear that I am not some tremendous gender diversity warrior. Like so many women, I have kept quiet and not spoken up in situations where I was too junior or the impact might be too great to have said something. It's only more latterly in my career where I feel that I have the bandwidth um, and the ability to be able to say something uh, and it not have the same impact. I absolutely understand why women every single day feel that they are not able to speak up when they see unfairness. Indeed, and I think it highlights the, the need for everyone to be courageous, but also if collectively, the more people that speak up, you don't feel as, as isolated. Yes. Uh, moving on to your current role, Charlotte, as I know we've touched on it briefly in the, the bio, but I'd love to hear about what you love most about what you do currently, but also what you dislike. Um, about about it so I'll leave that one to you to answer now. What do I love? I love that every day I get to get up and go to work with really smart people most of whom I've chosen to work with answering questions that I think are really important uh, with most of the time no one telling me how to answer those questions. Being a clinician scientist is a tremendous privilege the questions that arise out of my clinical work uh, and that are important at the bedside are ones I then get to go and think about and work about both in clinical research and um, but also in the basic science research that happens in my group. Um, I can think of no better way to spend your time. Uh, what is less good? I think there's probably the pandemic has shown us that the things that have been successful have been large scale collaboration. There have been the times where people have put their ego to a side and said, there's a really big problem that no single person can solve by themselves. We need a team approach to this. Um, and Coggy K is a brilliant example of that. However, the academic systems, often as they're set up, um, and the reward systems are very much about the single um, kind of front scientist who single-handedly saves the world being rewarded or promoted or um, in the papers. How we judge science is very much about individuals rather than teams. Uh, and that frustrates me because complex problems need 
a whole host of people. And if we're serious about things like climate change and pandemics uh, and other huge global health problems, then we need whole teams of people to come together and we should be recognising that. I, I couldn't agree more, Sharon, and thank you for highlighting that. I, and I think, you know, again, promoting that, that need for teamwork and collaboration in, in the different disciplines. And I think um, if we can all continue to do that, um, it, it will make us dislike that bit. <laughs> um, we're moving back to the, the positive side of things. I wanted to ask you about what would you consider your most proudest achievement to date? Oh, Henry, definitely having the most lovely now 10 year old boy um I'm not sure it's testament to my parenting or Will's parenting abilities lots of it is probably he's just like that uh, but absolutely my proudest thing and who has inspired you most throughout your career I've been really lucky that I have had throughout my career a variety of supportive and inspiring mentors um I can name some names without whom I wouldn't be here. Uh, Jane Warner, who I mentioned earlier, David Lomas, um, and I think Edwin Chilvers stand out um, amongst all others. Without those three people, I wouldn't have come to do what I do now. Thanks, thanks, Charlotte. And I think a lot of the people that you mentioned there, they're not just females, they're females and males. Um, so I think that again, we need, you know, we need both mentors that are, are female and male. Um, to kind of nurture everyone in, in science. And I think that's a really important thing that you've just included there in, in what you've just said. Just moving to the challenges I <laughs> next, Charlotte, what would you consider to be the challenges and, and impact of successes that you found working on the front line of the pandemic? I think it's been challenging on a number of fronts. Um, where to start so at the bedside I think when we look back it was very clear to a small number of us at the very beginning of last year so at the beginning of January that trouble was coming and it took a while for maybe the healthcare system um, and the governmental systems to realise how serious that problem might be um, and then it was with us very rapidly afterwards um, and I think the uncertainty of what was coming because was it going to be something that was as catastrophic for healthcare workers and as dangerous for healthcare workers as Ebola? Uh, it turned out it wasn't quite the same as that at all. Um, it was a very different set of challenges, but never before have hospitals or intensive care units had such huge numbers of patients appearing. You know, intensive care units in the UK had about 4,000 beds um, prior to the pandemic so in the January before everything got bad whereas this January we had over 6,000 people in intensive care units um, but we didn't suddenly acquire extra staff uh, to do that you can make a bed and you can make a ventilator but you can't train an intensive care nurse in 12 months um, so it meant we stretched a long long way with what we had uh, and there are consequences for the staff from that um, but also I found the misinformation uh, and the public space discourse around coronavirus really challenging. Um, we will all have seen all kinds of crazy things were out there. Um, everybody decided that they knew best and took to social media or the actual mainstream media to say their opinion, lots of which was not informed commentary. Um, so I had never spoken to a journalist about my work uh, or anything remotely to do with health, or really particularly had a profile that involved me engaging in the public space about my science until last year, um, when I was strongly encouraged to start engaging, um, because if people don't fill the gap and we don't explain why what we do is important uh, and provide facts that are based on reality, then actually the gap doesn't remain, it gets filled by all of the other nonsense. Um, and so I was very much encouraged by people like Jeremy Farrer from the Wellcome Trust um, and the Science Media Centre to start engaging. And once I had it kind of grew. Um, and so, yeah, that was incredibly challenging. Um, and the pushback you get when you say things is not pleasant sometimes. But I think it's really, really important that we do speak up because science matters.
And I would strongly encourage anyone on the call to, to read Charlotte's blog, where I know you, 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 you talk more about your career and you've done various media appearances. So I think they're, they're very interesting read and also very interesting to listen to. So for anyone who's on the call who hasn't read them or listened to your interviews, I'd really encourage that. Charlotte, I'm going to ask you my last question and give some time to the audience. Um, so my last question will be about people listening. So what advice would you give to young women who are looking to follow in your footsteps? I think all too often advice is given and people make their careers sound like a meteoric rise from A to B without any kind of hiccups along the way. Um, it won't be like that. It's never like that. My career was absolutely not like that. There were setbacks on the work and the home side at different times throughout that Um but stay true to what you value because nothing's more important than that. And if you really want to do it and you decide it's for you, go for it. That's the only advice I think I would give. Thank you, Charlotte. I'm going to move to the, the Q&A now. So please don't be shy. Put up your hands and put questions in the chat box. I have two which I'm going to start off with, but please do continue to post them. So the first one is um, from Sharon Peacock. And her question is, you mentioned that it can be difficult to speak up when you were younger, what advice would you give about other give to others about speaking up, and what would have happened to you? Do you think if you had spoken up? I might tackle the last bit of that first. Um, the answer is I don't know what would have happened if I spoke up, but there's always a fear when you are in the smaller proportion of people out there. So if you're in the minority group you have to try very hard to conform with the norms of what's around you and standing up and saying that normal is not okay is a very difficult thing to do. What would have been the consequences? I don't know, but I felt powerless to do anything in multiple situations. Um, and there have definitely been points in my career where I've been in particular meetings or particular arenas where saying something would have meant that you weren't part of that club anymore. Um, and these days I would say, that's fine. I'm really comfortable not to be part of that particular club anymore. Um, but at the time as a junior researcher, trying to make your way and your impact and grow your profile, sometimes being in those clubs felt more important than actually saying something. And I'm not sure that's right. And I feel conflicted about it, but I think it's important to be honest because it's something that lots of us experience. Uh, and then you might have to remind me what the first bit of the question was. The first question was, you mentioned it was difficult to speak up when you were younger. What advice would you give others about speaking up? I think these days I would say try and find allies, find strength in numbers in the senior people who are around you, because there are more than there ever used to be. Um, and there are some tremendous allies. Actually, I talked about Edwin Chilvers, my PhD supervisor earlier, and actually Edwin was for a large section of my early career, much more vociferous about the importance of and vocal about the importance of women in science uh, than I ever managed to be. So I was very fortunate that I had Edwin that I could talk to and say, Do you know, this just isn't fair. Um, and he was a tremendous advocate. So there are ways that don't always involve you personally having to say something. Um, but don't stay silent, don't swallow it, because it leads to feeling uncomfortable. Always share how you're feeling, because there will be others that feel that way too. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank you for speaking up. Um, when you, know, you mentioned that it was difficult for a while when you're younger, but then when you do feel comfortable, you did speak up. And I, and I think that we all just need to, to try work together and build the courage to speak up and make sure that our peers around us support us um, in doing so. Uh, moving on to the next question. How can we encourage men to see equal opportunities in science and medicine as not just a woman's problem? Absolutely. So the thing, and I know you know this because we've talked about it earlier, but I feel really strongly about is that equality and diversity in science are not a women's problem. It's generally not the women that need fixing. Um, and so the moment we allow it to be made into a woman's problem and that we own the problem, uh, then it stops being taken as seriously as we need it to be. 
Diversity in science is important because it makes for better science. Complex problems that have diverse approaches in the team that's solving them are generally solved better. And there's a wealth of evidence that supports that. So if we care about making patients better, which is what it's about for me as a clinician scientist, then good science requires that there are a diverse type of scientists doing it. Uh, and we need to advocate that really, really strongly. Uh, and it's not because it's the right thing to do. It's because not only is it the right thing to do on moral grounds, it's good science. Thank you, Charlotte. We have another question um, and it says, what do you think has been the main reasons you've been able to succeed in your career and make it to where you are today? Ooh, um, I think anybody who doesn't acknowledge the role of luck uh, is probably deluding themselves. Uh, I have absolutely been lucky. Things have happened at the time that I needed them to. Um, and sometimes it hasn't, but I've been more lucky than not. Um, but I think there's also probably something in the idea that the harder I work, the luckier I get. Um, but I have also had a very, very supportive partner at home uh, that's made a huge difference uh, and some really great mentors. Um, and I think probably that stubbornness, which can be <laughs> challenging, I guess, if you're <laughs> encountering it in one setting. But it means that if I really, really believe in something, I rarely give up. Thank you, Charlotte. That the dig deep approach and, and, and being stubborn, I think, is is a really, really amazing trait to have. And um, yeah, I, I just again can't um, say how how in awe I am of you of at everything you've done and and um, put your, making sure that your your voice is heard and that to people who are following in your footsteps. Uh, we have another question, which is during the pandemic, how have you stayed motivated and motivated your team during such adversity? Um, how have I stayed motivated? I guess I am a lung injury researcher. My lab and my research focus um, from the fundamental science point of view and the clinical science point of view has been around lung injury, you know, whether that's caused by influenza, whether that's caused by coronavirus, uh, whether it's caused by all the things that we see in non-pandemic consequences. We happen to be having a pandemic of the thing that I have chosen to base my research in. Um, and so it's fairly easy to stay motivated then because you happen to be an expert in that particular thing and people are dying in front of you if you're an intensive care physician. So how would you not want to do everything you can to try and alleviate it in any way you possibly can? Um, and actually, I think all of my clinical colleagues particularly have worked above and beyond what I could ever describe to you to save as many lives as possible and to improve the survivorship of those that make it out of intensive care and hospitals too, because that's what we do. Everyone has turned up and done their job above and beyond anything I ever imagined possible. Charlotte, you must find it difficult to find time for yourself. And then a question from the chat has been, how do you, what advice do you have for us and how you manage these demands for your time? I have, generally been pretty good at when I walk out of the building and I am at home um, that I am at home. Um, the pandemic has meant the boundaries between home and work have been blurred for all of us. I am sat at home in our spare bedroom that's turned into a study. Um, so it's been less easy but I think it's important to try and make time for the non-work side of your life too because without that you don't have balance. Um, I have, as I say, a young family, um, which I love dearly um, and are tremendous to spend time with. Uh, and I'm really quite dull and middle-aged these days, and I really quite like gardening. And we got an allotment in August last year, so I've been spending a fair bit of time doing that too. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, what are your hopes and ambitions for the future? Ooh. I think if before I got to the end of my career, I could have made some small impact on improving the mortality of people who had acute respiratory failure. Um, I would be really, really pleased. Um, and there's lots of ways in which we leave impact. Um, but one of the things that I believe in most strongly is that supporting the careers of those 
that come behind us is one of the most effective ways you can have a long-term impact. Because most of the experiments we do and the technologies we design, they will become superfluous. They will be bettered by the people that come after us. Um, but the people that come after us will learn and train more people. And if you do that well, and you support the careers of people to make them really great scientists uh, and to be the kind of human beings that you would want them to be, then they will pay that forward um, infinitely down the line and make a huge difference. Thank you, Charlotte. So I've just got through the end of the questions. Is there any final questions from anyone? And please feel free to raise your hand or pop them in the chat. And just while you're thinking of those last questions, just to come back to you, Charlotte, is there any final thoughts you'd like to say that perhaps we haven't covered today or that you wanted um, to tell everybody on the call? No, I think I would come back to thank you uh, and to say to all of the women listening, what you do is amazing. What you do is important uh, and you are important. So please keep doing it. And if you need help, then there are a variety of people out there from me, Sharon, all of you who can support each other. Um, and you should, because you will transform the areas in which you work. Thank you, Sharda. It's truly an inspirational story. And thank you so much for sharing, um, sharing uh, you, you, from, your, from the beginning of from your childhood right up to where you are now and really looking forward to, to seeing how your career progresses. And um, thank you again for being our first guest. Uh, Georgie, who's on the call, will be writing a blog on this and we'll also put it on the YouTube channel. I'm going to pass over to Sharon now, who's going to close the meeting. And thanks again from me, Sharon. Thank you. So massive thanks uh, from me. Um, your, 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 your kind of your story, or at least what we heard of your story, was absolutely fascinating. And and it's um, uh, somebody who's who very very determined and really got to uh, where they want to. Um, and and I think that's a, certainly a lesson for for me. Um, one of the things that I really uh, uh, picked up on, particularly towards the end of what you were saying, is that. Actually, what we do has really long term impact and we should be working uh, for the greater good, you know, in the longer term. And what I'd like to think is that actually women are counted in that number who are making a long term impact. And so I think part of the things we're doing here talking about women is, is part of that idea that we give women permission, that we support other women to actually make, uh, you know, contribute to that long term impact. And, and that isn't necessarily uh, being as you say, the kind of the one pinnacle person, but it, but we have to move away from that and think about teamwork and think about people's involvement as collective, which I think is the way forward. And that's what's happened during the pandemic. I mean, I would say that I'm very grateful to have you working at Cambridge University Hospitals and to have you uh, actually speaking to the media, speaking truth to the media and so on. I think that's, that, that's tremendous. So it, uh, it, uh, it's down to me to thank you so much from uh, everybody in, in COG UK. Uh, thank you to you. Thank you to the organisers of this. Uh, thank you to, to Catherine, who's chaired this impeccably. And uh, I have to say that um, I'm looking forward to seeing recording, which I intend to listen to uh, quite regularly and also recommend it to my children and their, and their friends uh, and so on, because we need, we need uh, voices out there uh, that people can relate to. And I believe that, that um, you're an incredibly, incredibly successful woman, but also a woman that's very relatable to. So I think that that can make a big difference in encouraging people forward. So massive thanks again, Charlotte, and uh, good luck uh, in the future. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.